on this edition of The Big Interview, The Talented, The Unique. The always entertaining meatloaf. I will not allow them to use the word legend, star, or superstar. I consider myself just another human being with a different job than the plumber. His rise to fame was not easy. Meatloaf struggled for years to be taken seriously. Now, this is getting deep. Oh, I, I am deep. I get very deep. People have no conception of it because it's Meatloaf. I'm, I couldn't possibly be deep. So many of his songs you know. Some have even become cult classic. I've had women tell me they've conceived by Paradise by the Dashboard Light. It's so long they've given birth to Paradise by the Dashboard Light. And DJs love Paradise by the Dashboard Light because it was so long they get up and go to the bathroom and get back. His personality. He's had dozens of hits. One of his best known songs, I'd Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That reached number one in 28 countries and won him a Grammy. During that time, he would also meet a man who would become his longtime friend and collaborator, Jim Steinman. Their first album, Bat Out of Hell, became one of the top five best-selling records of all time, with 43 million copies sold, and is still selling. With all his success as a singer, one might be surprised to find out, Meat, as he likes to be called, considers himself an actor, first and foremost. Hey, Tiny, who's playing today? Jolly Green Giants, Shitty Beatles. The Shitty Beatles, are they any good? They suck. He's been in more than 50 movies and television shows. My name is Bob. Here, starring alongside Brad Pitt and Edward Norton in Fight Club. Go ahead, Gwinez. You can cry. Now, Meatloaf is known to be a real character, so I was eager to get to know the man behind the persona. Well, thank you very much for doing this. Oh, no, thank you. It's my honor and my pleasure. Well, listen, right off the top, should I call you Meat or Meatloaf? Okay, Meat. And I have been called that... Well, let me go back just a little bit. When we first put out Bad Out of Hell, I mean, it's rock and roll and people have weird names. But everybody just kept talking about my name. I just, if somebody asked me about my name, I'd make up a story. Right. But the true story is my dad was a policeman and I was born bright red. I stayed red, so the doctor suggested I should stay in the hospital a little bit longer. So he comes to the hospital dressed in his uniform, I guess, one day, and talks to the nurses, and he said, "My, I'm doing the best Texas accent. My son looks like four and a half pounds of ground chuck. <laughs> so they made a card that goes in the front of the crib, and it said me, and he made them put me right in the middle and leave me there. <laughs> so all the other people that came to look at their babies, they saw me laying there with meat on the front of my crib. So that sticks with you? Yeah, it never went away. And in the eighth grade, I stepped in a coach's foot and he screamed, get off my foot, you hunk of meatloaf. So the next day I went to my locker and they had written meatloaf. <laughs> and they had written it as two words, <laughs> not one. And about the only thing that can make me completely insane is when people write my name as one word. Well, 
How are you feeling these days? I mean, you recently collapsed on stage, which everybody knows. How are you feeling? Yeah, no kidding. I mean, it was like, it was, it was all over the world. It was in Japan. It was in Hong Kong. It was in Germany, Norway. I'm going, I'm in Edmonton. I, it's like, don't you have anything to talk about? I had the flu on the tour before. And I never really had time to recover. And I was doing fine. But then two shows before Edmonton, and my wife is from Edmonton, and she was coming up. And she said to me on the phone, if you cancel Edmonton, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so I had to go on. I was feeling OK. And I hit the highest note in anything for love. And after I hit it, I got really dizzy. And then all of a sudden I went, oh my God, I'm going to faint. So I said, I'm just going to sit down instead of fall down. So I started to sit down, and on my way down, I just passed out. And the thing that drove me crazy as anything was on the real track of Anything for Love, when you get to the second verse, we have double vocals. So now with the advent of Pro Tools, I can make it sound like the record. So on two lines, I've doubled the vocals. So the band had stopped, everybody had stopped singing. They just didn't turn off those. So everybody goes, oh, he's lip syncing. No, I'm not lip syncing. They're double vocals on a track. Every in acting, that's what you aspire to be. That's what you've become in many ways. You've been in what, more than 60 movies I can think of. 61, actually. All right, 61, <laughs> there you are. But I'm interested in why this is, that you've been enormously successful as a rock and roll star, but where your heart is is in acting. It's because that's what I know, and that's what I've studied. I, I did some stuff with Strasburg. Um, he kept wanting me to come to class, and I kept going, I would love to come to your class, but I work constantly. There was a three-year period in New York where I would be rehearsing all day and then leave and go do a play or a musical at night. Anything that I went and auditioned for in New York, I got. And it started with hair in 69, and I stopped in 75 to concentrate on music. And, but how I got into music was through theater. More with Meatloaf when we come back. Meatloaf's latest album, Braver Than We Are, is a testament to friendship. Rarely in the music business do relationships endure like that between Meatloaf and his producer, writer and friend, Jim Steinman. This latest album is their fourth together. They've worked as a team since the 70s and have often been at odds. At least that's the way it's been chronicled in the press, but according to Meat, the headlines don't tell the whole story. The new record we have coming out, Braver Than We Are, I consider that a tribute to Jim Steinman. The whole album opens with a song called Who Needs the Young, which is the most politically incorrect song ever written. What makes it so? I can't tell you on camera. I can't, I, I, it's so politically incorrect, we'll get stoned. All right. Uh, but trust that, me. That would not be a new experience for me. No, <laughs> uh, or me, trust me. But 
and there's there's things like uh, I can give you one. Is there anyone left who can see? Blind them. It, and it's worse than that. It goes on. It's, it gets worse than that. Well, is this album like anything else you've previously done? No, because Jimmy, in a sense it is, and in a sense it's not. I've used characters for everything, but this one is more character driven than any other album because Jimmy wrote that song when he was 19. I did every song as a 19 year old. Right. Not the same one, a different one. There would be four or five days that I would spend just working on that character before I would ever set foot in the studio. The character a being a 19 year old. Yes. Not easy for a man your age to get no. a character for a 19 and the, year old. And the last song is called Train of Love. And I'm sure that Jimmy wrote it about a guy trying to find a girl. But I sang it as a 19 year old trying to find out who he was. Braver than we are. You say it's nothing like you've ever done before. No. Is there a line running to Bat Out of Hell? Oh, yeah. It's based on his musical, which is finally getting done in England in, in February. Uh, it was called uh, Dream Engine. Then it was called Neverland. He's been writing this musical since he was 18 years old. And he, we're the same age. He, he's 69, and he's finally getting it done. As, as a stage presentation? Yes, and I'm so happy. I couldn't be happier for him. I, it, it, I almost gonna cry, because it's been his dream for so long that it actually is happening. Well, we'll go back to Bad Out of Hell for a moment. Would you say that of all your works, you're best known for Bad Out of Hell? Oh, yeah. No I mean, question No question about it. Oh, yeah. It sold like 44 million copies. and Well, it's one of the biggest selling of all time. Yeah. It's if, either if third or fifth. the whole years. Uh, the span and nobody years, will ever catch it now. It's incredible. But what about... Uh, and everybody hated it when it came out. It took 10 months. And it took, it took the president of CBS named Walter Yetnikoff a couple of other guys, the guy who was head of CBS Classic, the head of Epic, and two of my best friends ever, John Belushi and Gilda Radner, to make that album actually break. And Gilda and John pressured Lauren Michaels for nine months to get me on Saturday Night Live. He finally gave in and put me on the next to last show in 78, that broke after that show. Ladies and gentlemen, meet love. That's what catapulted that idea. That's, hell. well, all the work I'd done up till then, but that's really, yeah, the rock that broke the castle wall. Now, what about Paradise by the Dashboard Lights? Oh, I got a great story for you. You ready for that one? Uh, remember Casey Kaysan who used to have America's Top 40? Yeah. Well, Paradise got to number 37, and he wrote a letter. <laughs> I have it somewhere at home. Somebody gave it to me. We've got to get this trash out of the Top 40. <laughs> he, would, he would be crazy at the moment. And what's in the top 40? What do you think is the best known song? Uh, probably the one I hate. Uh, I'd do anything for love, but I won't do that. Although Paradise runs really close to Paradise, maybe two out of three, but Paradise, I think more people know Paradise because it's done at almost every wedding uh, in existence. Anybody that gets married in America uh, they uh, play Paradise by the Dashboard Light, and I've, I've had women tell me they've conceived by Paradise by the Dashboard Light. 
It's so long they've given birth to Paradise for the Dashboard Light. And DJs back in the 70s and 80s loved Banner to Hell and Paradise for the Dashboard Light because it was so long they could get up and go to the bathroom and get back. <laughs> I'd do anything for love. You said you hated that song. I can't imagine it. Among other things, it, it helped make you wealthy and famous. I don't like feeling pressure. And I walk on stage feeling no pressure until we get to anything for love. And that was such a huge hit in the world. It was number one in 27 or 29 countries that I feel like the audience expects it to be absolutely perfect. And if I'm flat one word, I know about it the next day on Facebook. I mean, they will, they and will flat tell me. that's what creates the pressure on you, and that's the reason you don't like it. Oh, yes. It's a too, pressure tank. Too much pressure. Well, to the question of, I'll do anything but for love, but that. Okay. The but that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story. Let's go through it. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story before that. Jim and I were in the studio, and Jim goes to me, people aren't going to know what that is. I'm going, I'm going, what? You're, Jimmy, what are you, crazy? I said, do you think people, people are not stupid? I said, they're not stupid. They're going to know. I'll bet you $100. Well, I've had to give him the hundred dollars because I would bet you any amount of money that I have been asked that a million times. I, I, seriously, a million times. I can believe it. Uh, and it's a very simple answer. It's just that Jim, the way he writes, he writes, I will do anything for love. I'll do anything for love. I'll do anything for love. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. By the time you get there, to at those, after those four lines, you've forgotten the line that started the chorus. I'll never stop dreaming of you every night of my life. I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. And if he hadn't added all that other stuff, nobody would ever ask. It's nine times, nine different lines in the song that tells you what that is. It's the line that starts every chorus. But I'll never forget the way you feel. When we return, Meatloaf gets personal. That's up next here on The Big Interview. To hear him tell it, it's nothing short of a miracle that Meatloaf survived his childhood, much less went on to fame and fortune. He was born in Dallas, raised by his mother, who was a teacher. His father was a former Dallas police officer, but Meat remembers him more as an abusive alcoholic, one who beat him and once tried to kill him. Meatloaf would have to pull his father out of bars late at night with his mother waiting in the car. We have this picture. Your father, by your description, is an alcoholic, a bad alcoholic. Yeah. Your mother's a cool teacher trying to bring things together, hold things and together. A, and incredibly intelligent. How did that affect you? Well, they both died at the age of 54. My father died four years after my mother. I have a difficult time remember growing up and seeing their faces. I have pictures of them, so I know what they look like. 
but it, it's like if I walk around the house that I lived in when I was a kid, they're not there. So I think it has to do with guilt. I think because I, I was very rebellious and like I said, very mean football player. I'm still rebellious. The last thing I remember about my mother, I was back, going back to North Texas State, was we got in an argument. And it's the last time I really talked to her. So, incredible guilt. But I tried to jump off a bridge in 68, and it was my mother who stopped me. And she got me off the bridge, and I turned around, and it was a long walkway to get to the end of this bridge, and that person was gone. But this was after your mother died. Yes. So you're on the bridge, about to commit suicide. And my mother got me off. Well, let's talk about this for a moment. This was your mother's spirit? Yeah. But it's someone that you actually believe that you saw. Oh, I don't, I don't believe I, I did. And so she, she talked you out of it. Yeah. What did your mother say to you? What did she do that talked you out of committing suicide? She, I remember the line, you have a lot to live for, but there was a line that she said, you know that she would not hold it against you. And the translation of that? Was the argument that she would not hold that against me as being I the last it. thing. That you really felt guilty because, as it worked out, among the last time moments you were with her, it had been an argument. Oh, um, yeah. But now you're on the bridge thinking you'll end it all. And she says, well, you know she wouldn't hold it against you. Yeah. That's powerful, man. Oh, you have no idea. After I was off the bridge, I couldn't figure out. I, it was like beyond me why I was on the other side of that, that railing. After your father passed, did you have anywhere near the same kind of guilt about your father that you had about your mother? No, the only thing I had to do was I had to learn to forgive my father. Because um, my father tried to kill me with a butcher knife. It was about four days after the funeral of my mother, and he hadn't been home for four days, and he walked in the house drunk, and he had stopped drinking. My mother had got him to stop, walked in the house drunk. I was sitting with my best friend, his name is Billy Slocum, and I said, Billy, you better go. And Billy goes, yep. And so he left. I went, I said, just leave me alone. I went into my bedroom shut the door, turned on the TV that my grandmother had left me, and all of a sudden the door kicked open and I all I saw was this knife. In the and hand I, of your father? In the hand of my father, and I rolled that way off the bed onto the other side, and he came down in the middle of that bed with that knife. And my father had thrown me through plate glass windows, front doors, and I fought for my life. And uh, I think I was told I broke his nose, three ribs, and left him laying there. I mean, I, I was fighting for my life. And so what I had to do with my father was learn to forgive him. And to this day, I can tell you, I have, I love my father. He had a problem. Alcohol, alcoholism is a disease, and I don't blame him. This picture is called Pauper. 
If you want to know Meatloaf's private passion, take a look at what he's collected in his Austin home. I have the biggest collection of pulp art owned by an individual in this country. Really? It's a treasure trove of movie posters, ducks. I collect ducks. These are carved ducks? No, they're just a little rubber ducks. Now, man, you talk about rubber ducks, you're talking about rubber ducks. Wow, what a collection. And sports memorabilia. This is a game-worn helmet. From a career of rubbing elbows with athletes and celebrities around the world. Says to Meatloaf, you one of the best pitchers I ever face. Good luck, Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> Very cool. Tremendous collection. We know, those of us on the outside, we know you by your acting, by your music, by your touring, by all of those things, but, but who are you? Okay, I'm really very shy. I hate going out anywhere. I don't, I don't like going to dinner. I, I will go if the right person, if you ask me to go to dinner, I'd go with you. And I wouldn't want to be Brad Pitt. Uh, being Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt is, I don't know if you've ever interviewed him or not. I have. But he's a real human being, but it would be really hard to be Brad Pitt and, and stay that human being because I know what it's like for me and I'm not even close to that level. Um, so if I'm gonna go to the grocery store I know I'm going to get stopped. I'm going to get stopped and people are going to ask me to sign the milk carton. You just know that's going to happen. So you prepare yourself for that and, and you deal with it as, a, as a best you can. And about me, I will not allow them in any advertisement, record, touring, anything, to use the word legend star or superstar because I consider myself just another human being with a different job than the plumber. You spent the time on The Apprentice. Yes. There is this, this video of you going, what shall I say, I don't want to say you went nuts. Oh. You, you went berserk. And Gary Busey. But it was, it, it had started the night before. In the annals of reality television, there are a few moments like this. Mother What's wrong? I bought those mother sponges! Meatloaf was one of the contestants on season 11 of The Celebrity Apprentice. That was all mine in my basket. Bull mother According to Meat, actor Gary Busey, another contestant, got in fights with most of the cast. A combination of lingering tension coupled with lack of sleep, resulted in short tempers. I am the last person in the world you ever wanna with! Gary is driving me completely insane and I walk down the street to get a basketball that I wanna use with Mark McGrath. I say to Mark, I said, Gary's driving me nuts. He goes, me? And this is what my wife said the night before. Whatever you do, do not get angry. Because she knows when I get angry, I look out. Katie, bar the door. Well, he certainly didn't take your wife's advice because I clearly didn't take you... Any, well, they edited it. That's not how it happened. They edited it out of sequence. So it looked like a, a continual argument. Right. And they didn't... Sh they did but you've got to be really quick to see it, that Gary really did, I know this is childlike, have my paints and John Rich found Gary's. But looking back on it, you use the word childlike. Yeah. That was pretty childlike to have oh, that kind of explosion. Completely. It made me look really small. It's all coming back to me now. It's another Jim Steinman song. Yeah. Dumb originally meant for Bad Out of Hell 2. 
Okay, tell me that story because when uh, I know Celine Dion, Dion did, it. did did it. Yeah, she made it. It was enormously successful. Well, it's so a Jim Steinman song. It's a brilliant you, you song. You had your hands on this before. You, you could have been in Better Out of Hell too. Well, I heard it as a duet. Jimmy didn't at first, and then I explained it to him how it was. Whether he knew it or not, he wrote a duet. And he goes, well, we've already got a duet with anything for love, so I can be mad at him for this. In fact, Jim, I'm mad at you. So uh, uh, he knows I'm not. Um, I, we just were on an email before I got here. Um, he said, we'll save it for the next album. I said, okay, fair enough. In the meantime, Celine Dion called him up, or called up the manager, right. and the manager goes, you have that song all coming back to me now. And he goes, you've got that song, let's give that to Celine Dion. And Jimmy goes, well, ask her if I can produce it. And so she said yes, so Jimmy went, okay. And so when Jimmy did it, did I get mad? Yeah. I went, what are you Why doing? Why not? Because it, it went skyrocketing on the chart. Yeah. And so on Bat 3, I redid it with a girl named Marion Raven. And it was number one in Europe, uh, number one in Norway for 27 weeks. Favorite song. And I know it's very difficult when you've had as many successful songs as you've had. But if you can only pick one that you want to be remembered for, what would it be? It would actually, well, there's two. I can't pick one. I never have been able to pick just one of anything. There's two songs, one written by Jim Steinman called For Crying Out Loud. The other one is written by Tom Waits, and I recorded it, and it's called Martha. When I did it, I wasn't this old, but I, I sang it as somebody my age. And it's about a long lost love that he should have married and he didn't. And he's calling her up and basically telling her it was a mistake. For crying out loud is without a doubt the greatest love song ever written. And we're talking about Gershwin, we're talking about I, I'm telling you, it is the greatest love song ever, ever put to music. I'll have more with Meatloaf when we return. So stay here with us. Meatloaf's on-stage performances have always been in-your-face and physically grueling. You would never describe him as shy. He's always been a rough-and-tumble kind of guy, playing football in high school with a mean streak. He's also admitted to being accident-prone and clumsy, claiming by his own count to have sustained nearly two dozen concussions. You've had one heart yes. surgery, but you've had back surgery. You've had, what, 19 concussions? N yep, 19. I had my 19th on the road uh, in, in the last year. Okay, you've had all this. So here's the question. You've made all the money that anybody could possibly need. You have worldwide fame. Why do you continue to do this? Because there's so much to learn, and there's so much I don't know about either craft. 
uh, and there's so much about acting to learn. I have to learn something new every day, a new word. I'm really into science, into anthropology. I do every day, either on the internet, go find something, somebody like, I'll read about Stella Adler, I'll read about somebody that's been in their classes, I'll read, I've read three books on Brando, I've read about people that I think are real actors. Let me ask you this then, this occurs to me, in asking you why you still do it. And I don't, I never read anything about musicians. <laughs> Well, is your North Star, your navigational star that you're constantly looking toward, is that you want to be not just an actor, you want to be a great actor? Yes. I mean, I want to be great. I mean, I want to be great. I'm okay. I'm pretty good. But I haven't reached the level that I want to reach. I always like to ask the question of why you still do it. When I asked Merrill Haggard, the late Merrill Haggard, why he was still touring. He said he did it because he didn't want to get lonely. Now I wonder, is there anything in, in your drive to continue to record, to continue to tour, is it fear of loneliness? Oh no, <laughs> not at all. I spend more time on tour in my room by myself because on days off, I don't talk. You don't talk because you're saving your voice. You don't want to... Yes, right. for the show. Because right. people paid money, and if somebody's going to pay money, I'm going to give them everything that I have to give at that show, because I owe them. They don't owe me. I, in fact, I never hear them clap. I, I, don't, I, I can do the same show in front of four trees as I can do in front of 400,000 people. So, unlike many performers whom I've spoken to and I know of, you don't feed off the applause? No. The energy of the I audience? I don't even know that they're doing it. Interesting. Really interesting. Meet, you've been so generous with your time and generous with yourself. What question have I not asked you that okay. I should have asked I'm, you? I'm glad you asked me that because <laughs> I've been saving this one. Okay. I'm in Oklahoma on a reservation. I'm backstage and they go, the head of the tribal council would love to come and meet you. And I said, oh, please. I never let anybody in my dressing room, hardly. I go, please let him in. And so he sits down, we introduce. So I start talking to him about how do they run it? Are, are you the head? It's like, are there other people? You know, are there, you take a vote, and if it's tied, you cast the deciding vote. And I kept question after question after question, and he stopped me, and he said, do you mind if I give you your very own tribal name for our tribe? And I went, oh my God, I would be absolutely honored. He goes, okay, from now on, you're known as Never Shuts Up. <laughs> And so now your chief never shuts up. That's right. Um, never shuts up. I'm in that tribe, I'm known as never shuts up. <laughs> you know, with that reputation, you could anchor in at least a major big market. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah. I, I'd have to study that, though. You have to, you have to. You can't just walk on and be an anchor man. Maybe I could go on, you know, like in Waco and, and you know, be the local anchor man for them. For no, no, Chief never shuts up, could make it at least in Cleveland or Chicago. Okay. In the meantime, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you very, very much. You're, You're welcome. Terrific. And that's it for this edition of The Big Interview. We're always eager to hear what you have to say, so please follow us on Facebook, and Twitter, or send your comments to viewer at access.tv. It was a hot summer night and the beach was there.